to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practice of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you and praise you that you are a God worthy of all glory, praise, and honor. Father, forgive us for our sins, Lord, and the distractions that we have so easily on this world where we focus on the creator, or on the creation rather than the creator, Lord. Open our eyes and ears to hear your words today, to not be distracted by the things of this world, but be led by the Spirit in all that we do. Guide us with your truth, guide us with your spirit, Lord, till we are mature Christians like Christ in this world, that we may bring you glory and honor. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I entitled this Distracted About Good Things, and the reason that I took us to Revelation first is because Revelation talks about that, you know, I know your deeds, which is where we're at with Martha and Mary serving and everything, but the problem is, is you've lost your first love. What does your first love remind you of? And a lot of times we have to be reminded of that. That time that you spend with somebody that you just can't wait to be with them, that it just wraps your whole world around it and everything. So let's read Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 42, and then we'll dive in a little bit more about this love that Ephesus has to take us back to this love that Martha and Mary had. So Luke 10, verse 38, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. And Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. The word in there that's distracted, or whatever your particular version says, <coughs> is the Greek word pers per perispeo. I think I got it pretty well that way. It means to be drawn out. It's not only you're distracted, but you're drawn from something that you should be focused on. The King James Version says cumbered. It is distracted in such a way that you are drawn about or drawn away from the real purpose, the real importance. If we are spiritual beings, if our home is in heaven, then why are we distracted so much about physical, earthly, material, temporal things? Why are we not fixing our eyes on Jesus? Why do we not trust Him? And we're in this Gospel of Luke where we've got this far with Jesus' teaching and everything where He sent out 12 and then He sent out 72 and He told the 72 not to rejoice because they were distracted by casting out demons but to rejoice that their name was written in heaven. And we're to this point where Jesus is, is setting his eyes on Jerusalem. He's in his last year of ministry. And he's going to spend a lot of time in, in the uh, area where he's at now and probably a lot of time in the home of Martha and Mary and Lazarus. If the distractions that you have in this world also trouble you or worry you, that should be a telltale sign that you need to fix your eyes on Jesus that the things that you're distracted about don't really matter. You know, when I'm gone, it's not really going to matter. Somebody will fill my shoes. 
when I think I can be the only one that does this or that, you know what? Life goes on. And in many years from now, as Solomon says and everything, people won't even remember who you are. But if you can teach your children and those around you and spread the gospel message, then the word of God lives on through them because of what you've taught them and how you live. Why did Luke write about this particular event? Why now in his gospel? You won't find it in another gospel. Why did he place this right here? There's this little bit of scripture in this point, and the next part of scripture is going to be, you know, Lord, teach us how to pray. I think we all need to realize that we get easily distracted. We know the harvest is great and the workers are few, and we want to go out there and work, 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 but sometimes we focus on the work, 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 instead of the Lord, Lord, Lord. And that is a distraction. Jesus is continuing to teach and continuing to, tr to, to correct and to continuing to teach us not to think about things of the physical, but things about the spiritual, things that last. And even though you are working for the kingdom, you're working because God has given you the gift and the breath of life that you have, and He doesn't need you. He wants you. He wants your service. He wants your devotion. He wants your love. Because so many times when we get distracted about He needs us to do this or that, not only do we get distracted, but we quarrel even with our sister and start making demands of Jesus. Lord, don't you care that I'm serving alone? Oh, that I'm doing all this and Billy Bob over there is not and so forth and so on, let alone my own sister. And then we even get to the point where we make demands in our prayers are, Lord, tell them to do this. I'm doing all these things. Tell them to do this. Can't you see my heart, Lord? Tell them to do this. Wow, the distractions take us so far away from being where we need to be at Jesus' feet. I'm working. I'm servicing. I'm ministering. But what am I rejoicing about? Am I rejoicing that I have eternal life through Jesus Christ my Lord? Am I rejoicing that I get to partake in this harvest where seeds have been planted? Or do I put too much emphasis on me, myself, and I? Do I tend to be an expert in the law? <laughs> or an expert in whatever I'm doing? And I think that the things that I'm doing is going to lead me to any more to eternal life or any better recognition in the kingdom? No, I'm working to serve Jesus, my King, my Lord. And there is a time to work and there is a time to worship. And Mary chose what was a better part in this. And Martha chose to keep serving and brought about division even between her sister. And we've got to think about this in the body of Christ because how easily can that be done? Therefore, to properly serve the Master, you need to recognize who God is. Recognize His standard, His perfect standard. Recognize your sin, God's grace to you through Jesus Christ. Come to worship, listen to Jesus, and then serve Him with your heart, not with your mind. Of course, we're to love God with all our heart, all our mind, all of our soul, our whole being, but you're, if you're driven on your heart, you're back to that first love like the church in Ephesus. They had lost that first love. They, they had many good deeds and they, they checked false doctrine and everything and they were all standing good in the ways of looks and works. But their heart was not focused on Jesus like it should be in a first love matter. I'll read it again. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hands and walks among among the seven golden lampstands. The one who is the, this is his church and he will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against him. And there's seven letters here and most of the letters are corrective. I know your deeds. So what does he know? Deeds. I know your hard work. I know your perseverance. And if you remember back, uh, we're supposed to, in the first parable, we're supposed to listen to the words of Jesus, uh, retain them and by persevering make a crop. So these, these are all good things. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. All right, good job. I mean, that's what Jesus is saying. Good job. <laughs> but, what, but what's next? But, or yet, I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you that you had at first. Who is that love for except for Jesus, the one who laid down his life to save you from your sins? 
your master and your Lord. And again, if you get where I'm going with this, I want you to see why Mary was at Jesus' feet. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things that you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practice, practice of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So why did Jesus say you have forsaken the love that you had at first? Do you think about that? Do you have that kind of love? Most relationships don't continue that kind of love, period. And that's a sad fact. And even when you try to go back to that, you do it for a little while and then you get distracted about the one who is your love. And we do that in our physical life, so we certainly do that in our spiritual life and lose focus of Jesus. Have you ever had that kind of love with Jesus Christ? I mean, that's what all this scripture is about. The kind of love that you have, the kind of love that we have individually and the church has collectively for their Savior, their Lord, their teacher, their master. How much time do you spend in God's word? How much time do you spend in prayer? How much time do you spend in service? And is it what drives you? Just like, again, going back to when you were first in love with that, that person and you just couldn't stand being apart and you longed to see that person and do things with that person. The rest of the world kind of just faded away when you got to be with that person. Have you experienced that with Jesus? So I want to play a couple chapters Logan, from the Message Bible of the letter of Ephesians that Paul wrote to that church that first loved him. And listen to these words that, that Paul wrote. And you know that Paul loved the Lord with all of his heart. And he wrote this letter to the Ephesians. And I want to do it from the Message. You, the church, do you have that love back for Jesus? When you read his word, do you have that fervency with it, that excitement with it? The church in Ephesus started off that way where they couldn't wait till they got together and read about Jesus Christ and discussed how Jesus affected their lives. And then they went out to mission and did their works, but then their works distracted them. So they were working for works rather than for the one who that they were working for. I try to do it like the guy did. <laughs> do you have that kind of love with Jesus? Do you realize that you are the bride of Christ? Mary had this kind of love. That's why she was at the feet of Jesus. A place where she should not be. That was not a place for women to be at the foot of the master. But she was there because she couldn't help being there. Because she wanted to hear from her Lord. She wanted to be near her Lord. We can get a little more information from Scripture about Mary and Martha and where Jesus spent a lot of time at their house. In John chapter 11, verse 1, Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany. So we know this certain town that Luke refers to is Bethany. We know from Luke that this town of Bethany, this house that was there, belonged to Martha. So she's probably the older sister or the dominant sister. We'll just go with older at this point. We don't know for sure. But here John writes, Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary. What in the world does that mean? Mary? Wait a minute. Why was Lazarus not mentioned? Or why was Martha not mentioned if that, was, if that was the house that it was? But it's the village of Mary, the entire town. I don't know for sure, but here's what I think and what I'm going to apply to it. That everyone knew who Mary was. She was such an outgoing person, such a person filled with love that her light shined before men. They saw her good deeds and glorified her father who was in heaven. Everybody knew Mary, the little sister, if, that's, if she was the little sister. The, to the point where it was called the village of Mary. They didn't refer to the, the house of Martha, but that doesn't mean that anything's wrong with Martha by any means. The village of Mary and her sister Martha. Verse 2, this Mary whose brother Lazarus was, who, who now lay sick. So John mentions Mary again after he put who this was. Lazarus is sick. This is the village of Mary. Martha's her sister. Nothing wrong with Martha. Now this Mary... He mentions again, whose brother Lazarus was now six with the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. Now you don't find this much in Scripture, but this is not referring to something John has already written about. This is something he's referring to that he's going to write about in the next chapter. 
It's such a big event that John was foretelling it already in his writings. This is the Mary who loved Jesus so much that she was the one that poured oil on him and anointed him, sat at his feet. When the disciples said, oh, what a thing she has done. She has wasted all this that could have been given to the poor. This is how John sets up this Mary. And Jesus probably spent a good bit of time there with the family because we learn that from reading on how much he loved them. John 13, 35, Jesus says, By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. I wonder if it was Mary's love that got that town to be known as the town of Mary or village of Mary. What if you lived such a life that people equated Bonner's Ferry to you because of how much you loved Jesus and how much you loved others? Do people see that kind of love in you and does it glorify your heavenly Father that is in heaven? John noted Mary's love for Jesus and the fact that she poured perfume on the Lord and wiped His feet with her hair. A degrading act. Don't get it confused with other acts in the Bible like this because they're not necessarily the same and we get on that at another time. But there's no implication here that this is Mary Magdalene and there's no indication here that she was a scandalous woman. There can be different events in there. But we do know from John's writing this is the same Mary that in the next chapter will pour uh, oil on Jesus. As we read in John chapter 1, uh, John chapter 12, verse 1, Six days before Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. So he's got a dinner here. We've got a dinner back in Luke's gospel. He must have spent a lot of time with his family, especially to be known by the one who loved them so much. So back into John chapter 11, verse 3, So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. There's a love there that they have for each other. Not just a love that the three have for Jesus, but a love that Jesus has for them. But there's one that has a dominant kind of love that's an, an infatuation love, and that's Mary. She adores Jesus. Nothing wrong with Martha's love for Jesus. Nothing wrong with Lazarus' love for Jesus. But Mary's is one of adoration like you couldn't ever believe. Kind of like that first love would be when you'd buy roses and everything else and you plan out what you're going to do this week and that week. Not plan out a vacation once a year or anything like that, but you planned out everything you were going to do every single day pretty much. You couldn't long to be at home with each other. <clears throat> so the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love sick. sick. Martha served. There's her pattern. Martha was a server. There's nothing wrong with this. While Lazarus was one, among those reclining at the table with him, and that's appropriate for the culture and everything, Back to John chapter 12. Chapter two, 12, verse 2. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Then what happened? Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped His feet with her hair. Here's Mary again doing something she shouldn't be doing, but something that was absolutely adored by Jesus. The world looked at it as, oh, what are you doing? Why are you here? Woman's not supposed to be here. Why all this waste? And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume when she did it. If you didn't see her do it, you smelt the perfume and you knew it was there, that aroma that was pleasing to God because you were doing it out of a pure heart. Mary did an outlandish act of love. Verse 4, but one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who later was to betray him, objected. Matthew and Mark tell of, of account when a woman, a woman, we're not going to say it's the same one, did the same thing, and all of them talked about the waste that was there. So it wasn't just Judas. John is just pointing out here that Judas did, and he points out why Judas did. Um, Judas says, why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. Verse 6, he did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As a keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. But the response when an act of love like was, this was done, all the disciples at first looked at it as, why this waste? Why this woman did this? Instead of, wow, what a beautiful act of love. Jesus' response for that, verse 7, leave 
her alone. And Matthew records, she has done a beautiful deed to me. Because Jesus knew her heart. He knew what she did. She, he knew she took a chance to be scorned by the rest of the world, but it didn't matter. She was in love with the one who gave his life in love for her. And it changed her. Martha's nature was to serve. And again, that's a good thing. Mary was known for her love so much that it was known as the village of Mary. So let's get a little more background still. I'm going to go backwards into John chapter 11 again. Verse 18, Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. That put it within a Sabbath walking distance. So that meant that if you weren't in Jerusalem and you had come to go to Jerusalem for festivals and everything, you could easily go back and gather at Mary and Martha and uh, Lazarus' house, Martha's house that she owned. You could easily go back there. So this was probably a setting that Jesus spent quite some time in. If you go somewhere and you go on, on uh, a preaching out somewhere else, you normally stay with one family. That's what Jesus already told them from Scripture. He said, if you go into the house and they accept you, stay there. Don't move around. around. So Jesus was probably doing the same thing that he already told them. He probably spent a lot of time in this home, teaching and preaching. And Martha served, which is a good thing. But Mary also worshipped, which is a better thing. Verse 19, And many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them. Notice that. Martha and Mary. Now John probably is not as specific in his writing as the Dr. Luke is, but he puts Martha and Mary here first where he's already put emphasis on Mary. And many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard, verse 20, that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. She seems like that kind of person that takes, takes charge of things, good, bad, or indifferent. It, it doesn't matter. She takes charge. The problem there is you need to be careful to let other people do things to help you and not to be too much in charge. But that was her gift, her skill. But Mary stayed at home. That's interesting. Why did Mary stay at home? She had such love for Jesus. Why did she not come out and meet Jesus? Was it just because she was mourning for her brother? Because she had so much love for him as well? She wasn't distracted or anything. She just let her sister go. What did she choose at this time? That it was more important to mourn? I, I don't know why. It's just interesting. <clears throat> Verse 21, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. If you're looking, skip down to Verse 32. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, If you had been, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Exact same statement from the sisters. But let's go back to Martha. Martha said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. <laughs> then there's a but in verse 22. Complete opposite. Lord, this wouldn't have happened if nothing wrong with saying that, nothing whatsoever. But the next thing, I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Okay, why? Is it my own thoughts again? There's nothing necessarily wrong with that statement. Jesus' answer to her. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Verse 24, Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Now go back to verse 22. It says, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. She recognized Jesus as one from God. She recognized Him by His title, Lord. But does she recognize truly that God is standing there in front of her? Because if she would recognized that, would she be as much telling Him what to do rather than listening at His feet? And is it because we're so distracted by the things that we don't put Jesus in His proper perspective? And we say, Lord, I will serve if, if this happens or that happens. Is Jesus the King of kings to you and the Lord of lords in all of your life? Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Now he asked her personally, do you believe this? Doesn't mean she didn't believe it before. But again, where are her priorities? What is she getting distracted by? We see that even in John's gospel. 
She's focused on so many things other than just worshiping at Jesus' feet for who He is. Verse 27, Yes, Lord, she replied, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who has come into the world. After she said this, she went back and called to her sister, her sister Mary aside. So after she recognizes, after she makes her profession of faith, she walks away. Again, I'm not trying to point fingers at her or anything. That's not my point at all. She's just distracted. That was a perfect time to fall at her feet and worship Him. But instead she went back and she got Mary. <clears throat> She went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and he is asking for you. Now, I don't know when he asked for her in that concept. We don't have all of the dialogue that happened here. But we see the two sisters in comparison again. Jesus cared about both of them. He cared enough to, to tell Martha, I am the resurrection and the life, and anyone who believes in me will not die. Do you believe this? He got very personal with her. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, and they followed her. Now again, it could just be because of the urgency that she got up that they went forward, but they didn't follow Martha out. <laughs> well, they follow Mary out when she goes. I, I got to wonder why again. Supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. Well, they came to comfort both of them, but they seemed Mary's personality and her love seems to dominate what people see. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet. There's the difference. And said, and I had you look at this earlier, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. She said the exact same comment, but how did she say it? From a broken and contrite heart and spirit. No condemnation, nothing else, just Lord, I am mourning. And if you'd have been here, this would not have happened. Look at the response of Jesus. When Jesus saw her, verse 33, weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, they were following Mary, and because she was hurting, they were hurting. He was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. Jesus doesn't want to see us in pain. He is betrothed to us. We are the bride of Christ. He laid down His life for us. He gave up heaven, lived as a fox without a den to lay His head, and He died for you so that you would have eternal life. Do you love Him in response to Him with a first kind of affectionate love that no one else has in your, in your life, in your feelings, in your heart, in your emotion? One last thing to notice from John's Gospel. Skip down to verse 45 of chapter 11. Therefore many of the Jews who had come to visit who? Mary. And had seen that Je what Jesus did believed in Him. Martha is not mentioned here. Martha serves and Martha serves and Martha serves. And Mary serves some. How much? We don't know. And she worships some. And what did the people see even more? Even though your good deeds glorify your Father in heaven, they saw her love and they were drawn to Christ because of her love, not the deeds, because the deeds are motivated by the love. Works without your love and your faith is dead. It's only works. And you might cry out that day, Lord, Lord, did we not do mighty works in your name? But Jesus said, I don't know you. I don't think that's the case of Martha here. That's not what I'm implying at all. I just want you to see the difference in Mary's love for Jesus. So we'll go back to Luke 10 and apply what we've read here. Verse 38, As Jesus and His disciples were on their way, He came to a village. Now we know it's Bethany where a woman named Mary, so she's probably the older sister, who spent a lot of time with Jesus and a lot of time serving she is the one that opened her home to him. No condemnation, no nothing else. She opened up. She wanted to open up her home to them. She had a sister called Mary. What was Mary doing? Who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what was said. Now here's where you need to study Scripture, and I don't know what yours has. That's the NIV. But there is a word left out in the NIV, which is in the original text. 
Instead of reading just who sat at the Lord's feet listening, there is who also sat. That word also is in the original text. So what does it imply? That she also served and then sat? Or she also sat because others sat? Or she also sat because Martha did sit and then got up because she was distracted to serve again? We don't know. But I don't think that Mary didn't help Martha by any means. She doesn't come there and say she wasn't helping me. She just said there's more to do because in my own thought, and my own plans, there's so much more that needs to be done, but that's in my perspective. Mary reached the perspective that it's time to worship. So she did. So she had a sister called Mary who also sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. Verse 40, but a complete opposite again, Martha was distracted. She might have also sat at the Lord's feet and got up or Mary might have also been serving with her and sat down. She was drawn about, drawn away from the reason that Jesus was there. Jesus wasn't there to be fed. He was there to give spiritual bread, the bread of life, the words of life. That's the purpose that he was here for. It, the, Luke's gospel says it plainly, and Jesus says it plainly in the others, that he has come to seek and save the lost. That's why he's there. The one we met, the woman in the well, we don't even know if he took time to eat or to drink. He was concerned about the woman at the well, and there was a harvest that day. And the disciples did not understand it. Martha was distracted. She was drawn away, what, by all the preparations that had to be made. In whose eyes? In whose mind? When you do something, does it have to be this way? Do you have to have this much food? Do the, the table settings have to be set this way? Would it not have been okay to go to your refrigerator and get out some peanut butter and jelly crustables? Uncrustables? What are they? Uncrustables? Uncrustables. Would that not have been okay and people heard the word of the Lord? Or were you distracted about many things? I'm sure in your mind they had to be made. I'm sure in Martha's mind they had to be made. But in Mary's mind, they didn't have to be made. Mary did not neglect serving. It doesn't say that at all in there. She just knew it was time to learn from the teacher who was her Lord, who was her all in all. Martha, she came to him and asked, Lord, she addressed him correctly again, don't you care that my sister has left me so she was with me before to do the work by myself? Boy, that one hits home with me. I don't know if it does with you. But there are times when I sit and think, Lord, don't, didn't, what not, and, and, why, where's he? Why aren't he helping me today? And blah, blah, blah. Isn't that putting myself up and tearing others down? Isn't that division? Am I, am I not distracted? about the things that I think need to be done. And then look next. Tell her to help me. And mine's got an exclamation point. Lord, don't you care? Tell her to help me. Wow. To the King of kings and Lord of lords. I think if you understood anything about kings and lords, you would never talk that way. But I also want to say there's enough intimacy here and stuff that she did talk that way. And Jesus didn't scold her for that. <clears throat> Tell her to help me. Jesus calls us to serve, but he also calls us to not be distracted and to love and listen to his words, to long on them and let others see that. Psalm 51, verse 14 to 17. Deliver me from my blood guilt. O oh God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. O oh Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You take no pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifice of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. Again, I'm not saying there was anything wrong with what Martha did, but her perspective was not right. Her heart was not fully in love with Jesus. She was focused on serving and it literally, Jesus says it, distracted her from serving. She has not picked out the things that was better. Proper worship leads to proper heart, which leads to proper service, which is a more appropriate witness to others because they see the love that you have. You'll be known by the love that you have for one another. Jesus' response. 
Martha, Martha. It's not, it's not condescending. It's not uh, condoning her actions. It's out of love again. You don't see it too much in Scripture. You see Abraham, Abraham, Jacob, Jacob, Moses, Moses, Samuel, Samuel, all by God, by Jesus. You hear Martha, Martha, Simon, Simon, that he would reject him. Jerusalem and Jerusalem, oh, if you would just turn and repent, but he weep for him instead. And Saul, Saul, you'll be my instrument. Who wrote this letter to the Ephesians telling about the amazing love of God. This one that they could just be infatuated with and have this first love experience. Oh, and there's one other time where it's repeated twice. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because Jesus had to be forsaken by God to save you. Wow, that's the kind of Savior that I want to be in love with, that I want to live for, and I don't want to be distracted by serving and thinking I've got to do these things or I'm any more than I am, but realizing that I'm a part of the body of Christ, no more significant than any one of you, and we all play significant parts, and without each part playing its part, the body is not functioning the way it's supposed to. All joined together, all unified together, being controlled by the mind of Christ. Martha's on a very short list of who's who's, and Jesus said it with a longing love that I cannot even fathom. If he would call out to me that way, and he did call out to me when he called me out of the darkness and into the light. You are worried about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and since you demanded it of me, it will not be taken from her. <laughs> I like that so much in Jesus' answer. He didn't scold her, but he said, you know, you demanded this of me and I won't take it away from her because she chose what was better. You need to figure out what is most important to you. No condemnation, but out of total love. I appreciate your service, but I want your heart. I want you to be in love with me like that first love. And I don't want it to ever dwindle down. I want it every day till I return and make you my own. Some of the things you think about that are important aren't necessarily important. Someone else can do them just the same. They might be important overall, but what's more important is don't get distracted from the worship and who you're worshiping, even by ministry, even by good things. Jesus said, I, I came to cause division between your own, own family over your love and faith for me. Why in the world would you ever be upset at your sister for worshiping at the feet of Jesus? Why would you, if you're a disciple, ever be upset at a woman that came in and anointed Jesus with oil? Why? Except you're distracted by many things and your heart isn't focused where it should be. A better question that could have been put in this scripture, but it wasn't because Luke is making his point here on, on don't be distracted. And then the next thing he's going to do is teach us how to pray. A better question would have been, Lord, do you want me to stop serving for a little bit and come join my sister? Have you ever thought about it? I mean, that's the way we could have looked at it, just the same. Is there too much serving that needs to be done that is keeping me from, from worshiping you? Is it okay right now if I come worship you? I guarantee if you ask the question that way, your answer that you're going to get if you're listening is going to be, come. Come. It's never going to be to push you away. Serving is a must, so is worship. But according to Luke here, worship is much better. If you worship, the serving will come naturally. So I'll close with this. Is Jesus your first love? If He's not, what is and what needs to be removed? And if He is your love, are you serving the way that He has called you to serve? Are you praying, going back just a little bit in Luke's passage, are you praying that the Lord of harvest brings workers? And then are you going? Are you distracted by other things and other reasons that's keeping you from that? Because if Jesus is your first love, nothing's going to stop you from worshiping at His feet and from serving. Father in heaven, I thank you and praise you for your word. I thank you for Luke's word to us here, Lord, and how he writes this orderly account so that we do know what, that, what we believe. 
I thank you that he has included this passage in so we can take to heart that we don't need to get distracted. And as we go further into Luke studying, we see so many parables and teachings that aren't in the other Gospels where he's trying to teach us more and more and more about what it means to follow Jesus Christ. And then we see that in the fact that he wrote Acts and we see how they sold the things that they had because they didn't consider them own so that there were no people in need, Lord. Help us not to be distracted. Help us not to be self-centered, Lord, but be people of self-denial, taking up our cross and following after Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Help nothing to be there that is entangling us, Lord. Help us to give it to you at the feet of Jesus. And help us to not have any sins that encumber us either, not to give the devil one foothold, but to know that by the power of the Spirit we can tell Satan to flee from us and that he will so that we are children of light in this world, children of love, so that the world sees us and so that our village knows us as a Christian. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.